Hey everybody, welcome to your first official set of video notes for the school year. Hopefully a lot of the material within these notes is a review because it's scientific method and lab safety. Before though, I want to get into the difference between accuracy and precision. When you're doing labs in this class, you will definitely want to aim to be both. But first, let's talk about what they are. So accuracy is how close the results are to the actual value. What that means is, what should the value be and how close are we to it? Precision, on the other hand, is just how consistent the results are to each other. So if you're doing a lab and you keep getting measurements that are way off from what you should be, but they're consistent, then you would be precise. So what I want you to think about with these two is think of playing darts. So when you're playing darts, what's the goal? The goal is to hit bullseye right in the middle. So an example of accuracy in darts would be to throw a dart and hit the bullseye. An example of precision may be throwing three darts and maybe you land way off in the upper right hand corner, but they all land by each other. So the ultimate goal, right, would be to throw multiple darts and hit the bullseye. So just like with darts in science, our goal is to be both accurate and precise. Now that we know a little bit of that background, let's talk in general just about theory. So a theory is just an explanation of a natural phenomenon supported by many, many tons of observations and experiments over time. The results will always be the same. So an example is the theory of gravity. So let's say while you're taking these notes, your pencil rolls off your desk, it's gonna fall to the ground, right? If it doesn't, we have a bigger problem in that we need to reevaluate the theory of gravity because what's gonna go off a table should hit the ground according to that theory. Peer review is also something you should be aware of and that's just simply a scientific finding is reviewed by scientist peers before being made public. Now there's lots of bad science out there that isn't necessarily peer reviewed, but good science, stuff that you're finding in scholarly articles, has been peer reviewed by a scientist peers. Let's backtrack a little bit. So remember the metric units. So what phrase do we have that remembers this? All right, we have King, Henry, died by drinking chocolate milk. You may know it slightly different. Whatever way you know it is perfectly fine. Just make sure you know it. That being said, let's talk about our common metric units. So in science, we use metric. We're not gonna measure in inches or in ounces or anything like that. We're gonna use metric units. So in length, it's meters, our small m. Mass is grams, or if you're measuring something larger, you may be doing that in kilograms. Volume is liters. Notice how that's a capital L. And then temperature is degrees Celsius. Also, here are some common conversions. So take a second and write these down and you will have to kind of practice a couple of these in class just so we know you can do some kind of basic conversions. All right, now on to the scientific method. You should be aware of these and in terms of my class, you must know these steps in order and you need to also kind of know what's happening at each step. So whatever way you need to do to remember this is fine, but just remember you need to know the exact order. And we're gonna break in each one of those down a little bit here. So our first step, observation. You observe something happening and you wonder, hmm, why does that happen? We move on to step two, the question. This is where you actually identify your problem and you're asking a question. So maybe let's say I have two plants. I have an indoor plant and an outdoor plant and they're exactly the same. And I notice that the indoor plant isn't growing as much. So my question may be, does natural versus artificial light affect plant growth? Hypothesis then is your prediction. And your prediction should identify both the independent and dependent variables. And we'll talk about those a little bit more. But in terms of a hypothesis, you should not just be writing, I think. It should be something like, if light is applied to two different plants, then the outdoor plant will grow more. So that would be an example of a good hypothesis. The experiment then is when you're testing your hypothesis. An experiment should be detailed. It should also be numbered. 
if you turn in anything in this class and your experiment is in a paragraph form, you can count on losing lots of points. So a hypothesis needs to lead to your experiment, which should then be numbered step by step so I can test my hypothesis or your hypothesis or whatever it may be. So when it comes to the experiment, we have two groups, the control group and the experimental group. The control group is simply the comparison group. So it's kind of like the normal, right? So if I am testing different water on plants and I water one plant with salt water and one plant with regular water, my control is what's normal, which would be to water a plant with regular water versus the experimental group or what I'm changing would be the salt water that I'm watering the plant with. Like I said, there's also those two kinds of variables that you need to know. So independent variable, it starts with an I, think I. I, as in the scientist, it's what you are changing when you do an experiment. You can't tell one plant to grow more than another plant. You can change the light, change the water, change whatever. So whatever you are changing is your independent. And then whatever you're observing or what you're recording, your data, is your dependent. So think I for independent, as in I, the scientist, D for data, dependent, and it's what you're recording. When we do experiments, it's also important to keep constants in mind. So a constant is simply something that doesn't change. So like I said, back to our plant example, and sorry, I keep using plants, but they're just the easiest thing that most people have done before. So when you're doing a plant experiment, things you should keep the same. Well, it should be the same type of plant, it should be in the same type of pot or the same type of soil. It should be the same type of plant food or the same environment, unless that's what you're testing. So back to my example with indoor and outdoor plants, the environment would be my variable that I'm testing and then everything else should be constant. So a good way to check these is to put them into a sentence. So if we, let's talk about the plants in the water, right? So our independent, what I'm changing as the scientist, is the type of water. The dependent is the plant growth. So type of water causes a change in plant growth. Does that make sense? Yes. If I reverse it, plant growth causes a change in type of water. Ugh, that doesn't make sense at all, right? So that's how you know that your variables would be mixed up. And this is really common to mix these up. So remembering the sentence trick is really important to remembering this further as we go through class. All right, on to step five, the data. It's really important that you record all of your data. These are data tables. You should have multiple trials. You should be very, very accurate, those words again, and precise as well throughout your experiment so you get good data. When we talk about data then, there are four kinds that I wanna talk about. First, we're gonna compare them two at a time, I should say, is qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative, think, I underlined qual with yellow, think quality, okay? These are characteristics that you can't really measure or count, but you can describe them, right? You can describe how blue the sky is or how good some cupcakes in the oven smell or something like that, right? That's all qualitative data. Quantitative data is that's measured and reported. So think quantitative quantity. Write that up there, right? So quantity is a measured or it's a number. It's something that you're going to write down. So the height of plants, the weight of, I don't know, a person, a volume of a liquid over time, anything like that would be quantitative data. Now that you have those two, let's talk about the difference between observation and inference. So an observation is indisputable. If you say that the sky is blue, no one can have a legitimate argument with you about how it's not blue. I mean, obviously thunderstorms, et cetera. But besides that, right? If it's a blue sky day and the sky is blue, no one's gonna argue with you. No sane person anyway. And this is a fact. So it's something that you're using your senses to do. An inference is an educated guess. So we know it's almost August. We can look outside and we're like, hmm, wow, it looks really hot outside today. That's just based on your prior knowledge or observations. That's you, maybe it's not. Maybe you walk outside and it's a nice 65 degree day, right? But your inference is that it's hot outside. 
All right, on to step six. This is where we analyze. So data is your data tables, okay? Analyzing step six, these are where your graphs come into play and any other charts you may make. These are not data tables. Super important to keep this, this straight. Also, you wanna look for patterns in your data, which then leads you to your conclusion. So you're using the results, you're looking at your data table, you're making graphs, you're looking for trends in those graphs. This is what enables you to make a conclusion and then ultimately accept or reject your hypothesis. If you reject your hypothesis, what do you do? You go back to the beginning, you make a new hypothesis, you test again and make new conclusions. All right. We're also going to quickly cruise through the characteristics of life. So the mnemonic device I use is down here. It's Mr. H. Craig, and each letter of his name stands for a characteristic of life. So these are things that all living things have to have, all eight of these things, to be considered living. Some organisms have some of these, but they don't have all, like viruses, for example, so they're not considered living. First up, M. All living things have a metabolism. They need energy, they use energy, and all energy, you should know, originates from the sun. Second, all living things reproduce. So offspring resemble the parents, and there's two types, asexual, only one parent, it's kind of like cloning, and then sexual requires two parents. The H is all living things maintain homeostasis. This word you definitely, definitely need to be aware of throughout the year. So the homeostasis simply means the ability to maintain a stable internal environment. And within the human body, blood pressure, heart rate, body temperature, those things might fluctuate or go up and down if you go run the track or you're sick or something like that, but they should eventually go back to normal. C. All living things are made of cells. I hope you know this by now in your science background, but cells are the basic unit of life. All living things respond to stimuli. So any change in the environment is going to cause a reaction. So in our Venus flytrap over here, right? If an insect lands inside the Venus flytrap, it's gonna close on the insect. That would be its response to stimulus, which was the bug. E, all living things evolve and adapt. So environmental changes are going to cause adaptions over time. Keep in mind, this is a long period of time. This isn't you being like, oh man, it'd really benefit the human race if I could run faster. So I'm gonna learn how to run faster. And oh look, I evolved. No, absolutely not. That is not how evolution works. So please make sure you understand it's over a long period of time. Our first G then is all living things grow and develop. So you should know the difference between these two words. So grow, you're increasing in shape and size over time, which we do, but then we also develop. So you're maturing over time. Your baby self or your middle school self is a lot different from your current self. And our final G is all living things are based on a genetic code. So Traits are carried on the DNA. You inherit DNA from your parents, and then you pass on DNA to your offspring. So genetic code is what all living things are based on. And once again, quick refresher, Mr. H. Craig, I would pause here and write this down. This is a really great way to remember all eight of these characteristics of life. And that is all for your notes.